Stanford University. Today is October 6, 2016. I am Todd Gamlin, and we are about to proceed with the second session of the interview of Dick Gould for the Stanford Athletic Oral History Project. We are again at the Toby Family Tennis Center for this interview. Good morning, Dick. Todd, nice to be here again. Yesterday, you told us about the role that recruiting, how important recruiting was in pursuing this goal of yours of winning a national championship when you came on board. And you also told us about how the Junior Davis Cup camp played a role in that recruiting. Can you tell us what, what other steps or techniques you used in, 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 in recruiting, uh, in, in building up this, this, this fantastic tennis program? Well, I, I think for any coach, you can only do so much, and, and you can't build a championship team if you don't have championship caliber athletes. And so the biggest job was to try to get some interest developed and some kind of personal relationship with the players of that caliber from the high school ages, junior tennis as an example. And the Davis Cup camp certainly helped us with that regard. Uh, I, I think once you do that, it, it, Stanford's a unique place and, and you really, a good salesman really I think has, the best salesman really has to believe in what he's selling. And when you think about it, if you can't sell Stanford and all it has to offer academically, socially, uh, the interaction, the dynamic student body, uh, the opportunities that exist, the area, if you can't sell that, you can't sell anything. So uh, yes, of course, uh, we were always trying to sell Stanford, but I, I must say, when I started recruiting, and this might be a little different than, than some others, I really recruited with the idea that if you come to Stanford, you can be the best tennis player, or you'll have a chance to be the best tennis player that you can be. I, I emphasize that more than coming to Stanford to get a great education and secondly, play tennis. And, uh, and once I had made, tried to make that point, which of course I had no, nothing to base it on when I started uh, until we got going, once I made that point, then, and and tried to impress upon the child and his folks that, that I would be suitable as a second parent, as an example, a parent absentee, uh, for, to invest in their child or their child in, then, uh, then I would go more into the other things that Stanford had to offer. And instead of leading with that, I would end with that. Okay. I spoke to several of your players, and they, each of them said the thing they remember most about being recruited by Dick Gould was he wrote letters to us. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, first of all, Todd, you have to remember this was the dark ages. Right. I mean, you didn't have, you had a typewriter with a carbon paper, you had a mimeograph machine, uh, you didn't have a cell phone. Uh, finally, you got so you could leave messages on your phone saying where you were, call back, I've gone to the office or whatever. So in those days, communication was by slow snail mail. But what um, the, oh, excuse me, go ahead. <laughs> I must say that, as my sister and brother will attest, that our penmanship in, instructor in, in uh, elementary school is not very good because none of the three of us can write legibly. Uh -huh. I'm the worst of all. And I can't read what I write, it's just scr uh, chicken scratch. And yet these little one-page notes, I would send them out religiously every week and, and simply, in those days there was no rule as to when you could start doing that. The rules have changed and tightened up quite a bit since that time, but if a player were in the top 10 in the country and, and you have that advantage in tennis, these players do play in or throughout the country and they get national rankings, sectional rankings, and so on from the time they're 10 or 12 years old on. So you can identify players at every age group who are at the top. And uh, I would start writing the top 10 or 15 players by the time they're 14 years old and it would be a little simple one page note I type with two fingers, so that's longer than writing. Uh, and I say, hey Johnny, hope all's going well thinking of you. Um, and nothing heavy, just light, and hope your parents are well, and, and so on. And I wouldn't get very many answers, but I would do this every week. John Whitlinger, uh, who has followed me as coach, is my 
longtime associate for uh, 16 or so years and won the national championship in singles and in doubles and the team championship, first person to do the trifecta. Uh, he, he got, a, his, I still remember his address, 810 Hewitt uh, Street in Nina, Wisconsin. I don't know in those days if we had zip codes or not, I don't remember, but I remember writing that address every day for four years, every week for four years. And, and so uh, that was a big part of the recruiting that, that I did, a constant contact. And what led you to think that you know, writing letters, having this constant communication would be, would be effective in recruiting? I, I, I don't know why. I just thought it was a good thing to do. It was really the best way to communicate by the time you exchange phone calls and, find out and finally get together because my time and someone else's time in a different part of the country were different time zones. It was just easier to write. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and also when you write a letter, it's, it's really non-threatening. Uh, with my own children, when they went away to college, I would write a letter every week to them, but I would never ask them a question where they were obligated to, re uh, to, to reply. It would simply, hope you're doing well, thinking of you, missing you, or good luck this week, or whatever, and, and it wouldn't put a burden on them to have to respond, but it was just letting them know I was there, I was thinking about them, and then I was interested in them. Yeah. Now, I assume that when you were coaching at Mountain View High School and at, at Foothill, that recruiting wasn't a big component of, of your coaching. Um, can you tell us what you learned over the years while at Stanford, just about the recruiting process, how your recruiting methods changed of all, how recruiting in itself changed in the at the college level? Yes, of course, high school, you don't recruit at all. You have who's there. And, and that was really fun as a coach to try to develop an area where there wasn't tennis really big in that particular community and try to get guys from my football team to go out to tennis because we were good athletes and so on. You did with what you had. You did made do with what you had and we did pretty well. Uh, in junior college you couldn't really recruit outside your district but there were, in, in my case, there, there were three foreign students in successive years who were in the area and looking for a place to go and were living with families who brought them by to talk to me. I didn't recruit them from their home as an example but I happened into them. So I did have a couple of foreigners on my team then, and once they showed an interest in the school at their initiative, then I did recruit them hard to go there. Um, but coming to Stanford was an entirely different deal. You know, you, you, you had to get them to some way other appreciate Stanford and, and what it meant. Uh, as we got closer to the signing period, I would maybe do a home visit uh, and visit with the parents, get them the parents a little closer. I would encourage them, the top players, to come out on my dime to visit, which is nothing different than now. I really can't say I recruited any differently at the end of my tenure than I did at the beginning of my tenure. I think it was the idea of contacting them as soon as the rules would allow. There was no limitation when I started. They became one later. Um, trying to identify who had some chance, those who had some chance to be admitted in terms of high school transcripts uh, and, and their SAT scores. Mm -hmm. And, and then really concentrating on those players based on the national rankings. My sports are different than football or basketball, uh, where you must watch video and make subjective object, uh, uh, judgments. My sport is a little bit more like swimming or track, where you have specific times, you know exactly what they do and how your kids measure up. Mm -hmm. uh, I could find that from the rankings. And I would miss kids because uh, they would be players who develop late, but I went very, very heavily on the rankings. I, I, I felt that all along that of the top five high school seniors in the country in the national rankings, probably over a period of time, one of those five would be a realistic candidate for admission. Of the second five, another one would be. And if I got lucky, there might be three players in the top ten of the high school seniors in the country who would have some chance of being admitted to Stanford, at least worth their while to apply. So my job was to get them interested enough in the school so that they, number one, would apply, and number two, if they got in, of course, try to seal the deal with them. And, and we only had, we started out my first year uh, not fully funded, but we very soon we had eight scholarships. And there was no limit in scholarships at that time for men. When Title IX came about, it changed that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But eight scholarships is a lot of scholarships, and we had a lot of kids interested in Stanford, so that really, really helped me. And that's 
an average of two kids a year, but then sometimes as a pro tennis got developed in the late 70s, the kids, the agents would get ahead of the kids because a whole of the kids, and they would be trying to sell them on that they were the next great American hope and they didn't want to miss out on any kid who became such. So there was a lot of pressure on the agents to entice them, to sign with them, and to go pro. So that became a factor. So some years, instead of out of eight players, if I had two scholarship players each year, in certain years there might be three or four openings because a couple of juniors or seniors would leave school early to go pro. And usually that would happen after the recruiting season was over. So sometimes I'd have extra scholarships available for the next year. We were very lucky in that we were on a recruiting cycle, really by luck, whereby when I had scholarships available, there were also kids out there who could be admitted. And I must admit I had a lot of luck in that regard. If I had four scholarships, there happened to be four good scholarship players out there. And my job, of course, was to get them. We were very successful. It, it really, you know, being in a place like Stanford, you, I think my biggest fear was that I would over-recruit and oversell, and people would not they would doubt the validity of what I was saying because I would be talking in such superlative terms in my description of Stanford, what Stanford life was like, having been a student here, having coached here. And so I really had to calm myself down and not make it sound like it was not plausible that it could be this good. That was really one of my biggest fears. A pleasurable fear to have, by the way. What was your message to the recruits? That is, you're sitting down with the recruit. What are you telling them about why they should come to Stanford or how Stanford could help them? Number one, I think you're going to really enjoy your experience here. You enjoy the people you meet. Uh, I think you and I can get along well together. I think you're going to be seeing me three or four hours a day, uh, six days a week. Uh, you'll be seeing and spending more time with me and much more, much more time with me than you have been with your parents. Uh, you, know, you come home from school, you do your little homework maybe or after practice, you eat dinner with them maybe, and then you, have, you go to your room and study and uh, you see your parents a couple hours quality time a year. I'm going to be seeing you every day in the most trying of circumstances after you've broken up with your girlfriend, after you feel badly about your test result, uh, after you have lost a big competition. I'm also going to be seeing you when you excelled in different times. And so if you don't think you can get along with me and like me and like my approach, then you don't belong at Stanford and you, don't, you shouldn't be working with me. But if you think you can do that, I think the record will show that, that people have enjoyed their experience and that would be the first thing. Uh, secondly, if you come to Stanford, the record has shown, as I could say this after the first four or five years, you're going to improve in college. You're going to get a lot better here. Good enough, in fact, if you really want to do this, you will have a future as a pro. And then, of course, the next step was as these kids went out and started doing well in the pros, uh, I could go to point to them and say, as so-and-so has done, as so-and-so has done, as so-and-so has done. And in fact, we have some advantages because we're on the quarter system. Uh, if you're doing really well and you think you're going to turn pro the following year, you can take winter quarter off if you work hard and get ahead in school your first couple of years and still graduate the end of that year. So you can take the winter off and play this really good pro circuit that exists as as Roscoe, as uh, Sandy Mayer did, and many of my other players who turned pro after three years. They were far enough ahead, they could take winter quarter off, but we didn't have a lot of max in those days, and play the pro circuit. And that's one thing tennis gives you an advantage of. You can play as an amateur in a pro event and actually get a pro ranking based on how well you do, you just can't take the prize money. So that was really nice for tennis. And the quarter system was an advantage for Stanford, mm -hmm. and, and most schools don't have a quarter system. So I, I sold that pretty hard. What kind of challenges or hurdles did you face in your recruiting efforts over the years, such as dealing with the admissions department and things of that nature? You know, it's easy to complain about, gosh, this kid didn't get in, he's a great kid. But the admissions office, I learned, was really my best friend. Very seldom did I ever, I would never get a bad kid, as an example. Uh, that was all shifted out and sorted out before they were admitted. So, in a way, they were my best friend. Obviously, the disappointments are people I felt that really could have grown at Stanford and, and taken on the challenge and excelled. In fact, I think most people from the missions will tell you right now that 90%, 95% of the students they turn down are capable of doing the work and, and getting by satisfactorily. I think that 
when I first started, the emphasis was more, and, and in fact, when I applied, which probably let me get into Stanford, the emphasis was more around the all-around person. I don't know whether this would be admitted by admission, but my gut feeling is that as time went on, it became more the person who had excelled in something, who had really taken some project, whether it be helping other people, and not participated in the club fundraising drive, but actually formed an organization and led an organization nationally or internationally, or did something in the field, uh, some kind of outstanding prize in a field that was above and beyond what the normal student would do. Someone who was really exceptional. And as this feeling started to, in my mind, started to develop, of course, that became really important in recruiting a top athlete because that meant he had really, or she had, really excelled in something along with really doing good work in school and academics. And as you look back at it, this makes for a very dynamic, diverse, incredible student body. And I think the first thing that will happen when you talk to students here now is how they are inspired by others around them, how that pulls them up. Mm -hmm. uh, my son was a swimmer at Stanford. He wasn't a great swimmer. He wasn't recruited. The coach promised him a spot in the team. But it happened. He was a backstroker, and he was always swimming behind two different NCAA champions, one of them an Olympic gold medal winner. Uh, they overlapped in years, and so he always had someone ahead of him in the lane that was pushing him to get better by virtue of who they were and what they had accomplished. And in fact, he became a pretty good swimmer and finished sixth or seventh in the nation in the NCAA. So not that he was great, but the people around him made him better. And I think that's something that Stanford can offer that, that other schools can too as well, but I'm pretty prejudiced at this place. I want to move to a slightly different topic. Um, during your first few years at Stanford, who were um, <clears throat> some of the other coaches or other members of the Stanford community uh, with whom you form relationships and were having an impact, an impact or influence on what you're trying to accomplish here? I, well, first of all, when I started, we only had seven sports. It was men only, and it was football, basketball, track, baseball, golf, tennis, and swimming. And, um, and I guess water polo slash swimming. And uh, football had just a handful of assistants. Many of those assistants coached other sports as well. Basketball had one assistant. Um, there were freshman teams in all sports. Freshmen could not play in that in, on the varsity. Uh, baseball, I think, had just a couple of coaches. Um, some coaches coached two sports in the years before that even. But people that stood out of my so it was easy to get to know the coaches. As a PE major, every coach had to teach a methods course to the, to the students. In football, it was the, the exception because the assistant coaches spoke. One would speak one day on line coaching, one would speak the next day on practice organization, the next meeting, and so on, rather than head coach. But all the other head coaches, our basketball coach, Howie Damar, taught the methods course on how to coach basketball. Uh, Peyton Jordan taught the uh, track the uh, track and field coach. Well, that was an excellent course uh, on how to coach track and field. Uh, Dutch Faring taught the baseball course. Uh, a guy who was a part-time tennis instructor taught the tennis, or full-time tennis instructor, but not the coach, taught the tennis co course. I, I think I got an A in the course, but I got an A minus in the final because I had to describe the forehand, and I forgot to describe how to hold the racket. So, so I barely got an A in my own sport. Uh, but this was good because you got a relationship in a small group of class, a small group of people with a coach. Then I, a few years later, I started coaching those people, and one of the people I looked up to the most and learned the most from, I would, I'll mention two of them. Uh, one was John Ralston, who took us to the Rose Bowl in 71 and 72 as a football coach. Incredible person. And... I learned from John several things. I learned, number one, you hire the best people available. And if you look at the assistants he hired, uh, Mike White, uh, Roger Theater, who just passed a couple of days ago, um, uh, Homer Smith, uh, uh, Dick Vermeil, uh, Bill Ralston, uh, John Ra excuse me, Bill Walsh, you can go on and on and on. He hired good young coaches. And these coaches really made him look good. So I learned from that at that point, never to be afraid to hire someone who might be better than you are in what you do. These guys were young and just starting out, but they all, it's amazing the number of people he had who went on to be successful. 
successful pro and college coaches, incredible. I also learned from John, and he told me this one day, and I'll never forget it. He said, Dick, you answer every email, excuse me, you answer every letter and every phone call yourself and immediately. And uh, this is something that I've been religious on. Uh, the thank you is written before the gift arrives as an example when it's in the mail. And, and this is, and, and, I, and I'm known for this, and I'm very proud of this. Um, I learned also from John, and this was very, very important, that you never make an excuse or give an alibi. I never heard John make an excuse and say, well, we just aren't getting the right kids in. We can't get this past admissions, as an example. I, I, I learned you never, never say this. I, I, to this day, I, Fred Hargendon, our director of admissions, became a good friend of mine. And uh, he was telling me John would take him out to lunch every week <laughs> and be talking to him about this kid or that kid. But uh, I think those three things, uh, to don't be afraid to hire the best people, even though they might be better than you, hire to someone to cover your own weaknesses, to respond to everybody immediately and completely, and to stay positive and don't make excuses were very, very important in my, in, in my development. I learned a ton from Peyton Jordan as track coach, uh, one of the nicest, most upstanding people you would ever have the chance to know. Peyton did everything in a first-class manner. When he put on the track meet, it was an orchestrated uh, symphony. Everyone, every official was in a red blazer, dressed to the hilt, knew exactly what he or she had to do and how to do it. Um, we had great large dual, dual track meets were a bigger thing in those days. And we had great dual meets in the stadium. I'll never forget, he put on the, he was a great promoter, and he put on the United States Russia track meet in the height of the Cold War negotiated with the Russian government and uh, two years in Stanford Stadium. The Stanford Stadium was filled uh, for a two-day event there, uh, an incredible event. And to see these mortal enemies uh, holding arms at the end of the day, everyone's in tears as they walked around the track together and waved at the fans. But learning how to do things when you do an event the right way, dreaming big in terms of the kinds of events you can do and can hold, and then pulling it off with extremely great organization were things I learned from Peyton, um, uh, an amazing person. Uh, and I can go on with the other coaches too, they were all special to me in some way. I, I think I did learn and I formed, formed good relationships with them and, and their assistants, but in those days the staff was so small. Uh, I got very close to them and it took me a few years to realize no sooner you get close to an assistant coach or a head coach then they move on and a friendship becomes harder to keep from a distance. So nowadays our staff, uh, our, our athletic department represents about 350 people and it keeps turning over and the younger people keep turning over and I'm a little more reticent to form really close uh, friendships because the chances of those friendships lasting mm -hmm. are not quite as good. That was a big thing, a hurtful thing for me to realize. What, um, are there coaches that stand out in your mind that in your view made really meaningful and significant contributions to Stanford athletics? I think John Ralston, number one, because he came in an era where it was very easy to make, everyone was making excuses. I'm not talking negatively about any one person, but it was a theme of the athletic department, unwritten, that, well, we just can't get this done. A smart kid can't be smart, do his schoolwork, and do his athletics. It just doesn't work. We can't win at Stanford. It was pervasive, and it carried over to the athletes. It was a very difficult thing. Uh, and John Ralston, I think, and I hope myself, helped change that. Uh, I was this young kid on the block, but by gosh, we were going to win a national championship. I think I mentioned, I was laughed at literally when I would say that in public or to an individual. Uh, that can't be done at Stanford. And uh, so that was a very, very important thing. Uh, I looked later on the tremendous impact Mike uh, Montgomery had at Stanford. Uh, a tremendous individual, a dry humor, but he coached his own way, he had his own philosophy, he liked the big man in the center, built his offense around that, but the success he had was incredible. Uh, regularly top 10, uh, top 25 at one time, along with Duke and maybe North Carolina, 
one of only three schools to be in the top 25 for 10 straight years without ever dropping out for weeks, something like that. Uh, I have a tremendous respect for what Mike Mon Montgomery did, uh, something that people didn't think was going to be possible. John Ralston, what he did, back-to-back -back rules, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I look at our coaches, I look at Mark Marquis. I look at the way his players compete on the field. Um, they always run on and off the field full speed. They actually maintain much of the field themselves by working and driving the tractors to keep the infield raked up and so on. Uh, I, I marvel at what he does. I marvel at how he encourages his players to get ahead academically. So if they do bypass their senior year by turning pro and going into the draft, that they, it's easy for them to come back. Um, uh, there have been many, many others, but uh, I, I really admire those people. I had a, a co-worker for a long time, Frank Brennan, uh, did a great job with the women's program for 21 years. And we shared a little office the size of the table I'm sitting at now. And uh, I thought he did a phenomenal job as a positive person uh, with his athletes. Uh, I think of my associate, John Whitlinger. You couldn't find a more loyal or better associate. We complement each other so very, very well. Uh, it just, the people, I've been, I've been blessed to work with great people in this department. The athletic directors I've worked for have all been different, uh, starting with Chuck Taylor, who was in those days the football coach at some point retired and became athletic director. That's the way it was. It wasn't a big business per se. But Chuck was perfect for the time he was here. And he was an AD probably uh, from 1963 up until the early 70s when Joe Rich took over. Joe Rich was from the development office, but he also uh, was one of the football on the football staff for a while. Went to Notre Dame, was a good football player there. Joe Rich, a different personality, uh, struggling a little bit with illness, maybe a cancer part of that time. But Joe was the one who had the guts and the gumption to start Title IX at Stanford when it became a uh, national rule that women are treated equally in the workplace, uh, et cetera, uh, not just sport. Uh, he was the first, one of the first people nationally as a leader to jump on, it, on this for, for, uh, for athletics. And I think that's one reason Stanford's won so many director's cups. He jumped on it early. We got a great start at it. Uh, the, it was not, the women were not members of the NCAA then, the NCAA did not handle this, so they had their own organization called the AIAW, mm -hmm. Association uh, for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, and that was the national championship for many hundred years. I'm very proud of the fact my wife, uh, Anne, when the first, she was hired when Title IX came about. She was actually teaching my kids some of my home court, and uh, I saw how she taught, she worked with me in some, some of the programs. With, a program I ran, Sally Ride, the astronaut, was one of the people that worked with her a lot, and uh, we had a great group of gals and guys teaching in that instructional program. But I liked what she did so well, I had her, I entrusted my own kids to her. And then when the job at Stanford opened up, I went out and said, you know, I think you could do this job. You played at Stanford, you played Junior Wimbledon for Junior representing Venezuela, and you were living there, and your dad was working for an American Steel Company there. And she wasn't sure she could do the job, but she was willing to try. At the time, she was an assistant pro at Menlo Circus, Cir Circus Club. So she came to Stanford, took the job, and held it for four years. And during that time, uh, starting in 76, I think, and actually won Stanford's first national championship for women in any sport in 1978. And so I really enjoyed working with her, obviously, so much that we ended up getting married. and. And uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting because in those days, because of our personal relationship, partly, uh, we, again, we shared an office as big as this table, two desks back to back. Uh, it was a shack, it was known as a shack. There were articles in newspapers written about yeah. it. It was because winners were coming out, championships were coming out, it was a little, little, little beat up old thing. Uh, but everything we did as a team, we did as a joint team. We took the word Title IX and made it synonymous, it was not a, women's tennis team and a men's tennis team, it was the tennis program. When we had team banquets, we, we did them together. When we go on team trips, we would do it together. Uh, they had their own schedule set by the conference, we had our own schedule, but whenever we could, fundraising events, we did them together for the benefit of both programs. And it really was more than any other sport ever here at Stanford. Maybe sailing might be one, 
but it really was a joint program and still is to this day. I'm very proud of that. I think we set a good precedent. Let me, um, <clears throat> I want to go back to the, to, you know, the merger of the two programs and, and, and that, but I'd like to ask, you know, you mentioned you're working with Chuck Taylor, Joe Ritz. Um, tell us about Andy Geiger. What did you enjoy working about with him? How did you feel he contributed to the, to the athletic programs? I, Title IX was very controversial. Uh, Stanford Athletics was supported by a thing called the Buck Club. My dad, I think it started the year after he graduated, he became an immediate member of the Buck Club. And it was provide financial help for the athletic program, and it was called Buck of the Month. And the idea was, during the Depression even, to pledge one dollar a month toward the athletic program. And my dad was the, joined it the first year he could join it, as an example, and remained a member of it ever since. So this book club grew and grew and grew and started giving scholarships to men. They weren't full scholarship at the time, they were just uh, tuition, and tuition wasn't that high. But still there was money to be raised that wouldn't be funded by the university as a general, as gen in general. So Joe Ritz had the job of making this transition. It was not a popular transition among alums who were very protective, protective of what the men had done. In the 70s we won uh, seven national championships, whereas there were only two won in the two decades before. Uh, men's golf in the 50s and men's swimming in the 60s. And so everyone was afraid of what might happen, the exception being the women's championship in 78, but it was really a men's sports world. And now all of a sudden you're bringing all the women over to the men's facilities and giving them the same opportunities and giving them the same financial opportunities. And the Buck Club was really threatened by this because all of a sudden things had to be equal and you had to give an equal number of scholarships, an equal number of sports. We only had seven men's sports at the time. And as you add more women's sports, then you add more men's sports, we have something like 36 sports now we're supporting. So this was a very unpopular move and by well, many people, the men in particular. Uh, a lot of things changed. Women have their own swimming pool. At the old Encina gym pool, uh, men would go in in recreation and not wear a swimming suit. Well, when it changed and then everything was open to everybody, it took some of these guys a, a while to learn to put on a suit before they went in for the recreational swim. Uh, a lot of things changed that way. So, so Joe, when Joe retired, Andy inherited some of this, Andy Geiger, and it was really worrying on him. And finally, the idea was to merge uh, the Buck Club with the women's fundraising group, the Cardinal Club, and merge them together. And Andy led that. But I think the big, and, and it was really hard on him. And he, be, he wasn't really befriended by a lot of people because of this. It took him a long time to make this more of a normal situation. And it was the same throughout the country, Stanford really taking the lead in this. But I remember Andy, I, I really like working for Andy and, and, and all these guys because they, they didn't care much about tennis. It was kind of a nuisance. And they, they would say, well, Dick, we can't do this. We can't do this. They did give me scholarships, but we can't do this. We can't do this. If you want to do it, do it yourself. So it gave me a great latitude to be creative, and that's how I started uh, really after five, six, ten years to really concentrate on fundraising for a lot of things that we can talk about if relevant. But Andy really, I would, know, I would characterize Andy as the visionary behind the building that we've done here on campus. Um, I have to check my notes here. I think Daguerre Pool was the first thing, Maples Pavilion was the first thing that was built. That was in uh, 1969, my second year here, third year here. Roscoe Maples family. Roscoe, I, I didn't, ironically, was the uh, president of the Northern California Tennis Association, but his money went to the basketball pavilion. Uh, in 1974, Daguerre Pool was built. That was during Joe Ritz. Both of those uh, uh, were during Joe Ritz's tenure. But then Andy Geiger really took this to the next level. All of our facilities were built, including football and sunken diamond and baseball, the tennis courts in the 20s, and with no improvements for basically almost 40 years, 50 years. And so Andy said, we're going to change that. We have to bring Stanford up into the whatever late century it was, and, and uh, he had a tremendous vision. And I think of the decade or so that he was the athletic director, the, the decade of building. And he was criticized a lot because he spent a lot of money that he didn't have. 
and in those days you took on a lot of debt if you didn't have it paid for before and guaranteed payments before you built. Now the rule is you can't start something unless it's funded, not pledged funded. And, uh, and when he left here, we were in a lot of debt. And I talked to a good friend of mine, was Alan Cummings, who became the uh, interim AD after Andy left, and was the, the financial guy under Andy. I said, you know, it's amazing how reckless Andy was and what he did here uh, in spending and driving up this debt. And he said, Dick, this never would have happened if he had not gone out on a limb and done this, and we paid off that debt now. So you should be thankful for what Andy did. And it really made me stop and think. I love working with Andy because he let me do things that, that, uh, that I couldn't maybe otherwise get done. And he was uh, a visionary in many, many ways. Uh, it was fun to be around. And uh, again, very different from Chuck Taylor, who was very different from Joe Ritz, and Andy Geiger, very different from, from, uh, from Joe Ritz. And then after Andy finally did leave and went to Ohio State, where he did the same thing. He led a building program and put them in great debt, but now it's paid off and it's been great. But then he was followed by Ted Leland, who I really enjoyed working with for almost 15 years. I, I was very blessed to have great athletic directors along the way, people that were all different, but with whom I could always, it was always an open door. I could always go in and not always get what I wanted, but I could always present my case. Yeah. And I love that opportunity. What, what impressed you or influenced you about uh, Ted Leland? Ted was a dreamer. I'll, I'll never forget. I would say if Andy, character, if Joe Ritz characterized Title IX and Andy was known for starting the building and renovation program, really seeing it through, uh, I would say Ted Leland was known as the guy who won championships. In fact, I think in his tenure, there was a tenure period when he was AD where Stanford won uh, something like or won in 39 national championships, something like that, in a 10-year period, and, and incredible. And the most we've ever won in a 10-year period. And I'll never forget, uh, <coughs> in one of our coaches' meetings, he'd start, he'd go up at the end of the year, and he'd say, well, guys, you know, we did a pretty good job this last year. We won six national championships. And, you know, Chris, I was really proud of that, because no one ever thought of anything like that happening. But he said, we had, six or seven instances where we're second or third, we have to do better. We have to convert those second and thirds into firsts. And we never won more than six in any one year. But that kind of reminds me of the optimism that Ted had. Uh, he was an incredible person to work with. He, he really, uh, I think, became very close. They lived on campus. Uh, he and Stephanie, his wife, opened their home to students and student athletes on many occasions regularly, uh, often had student athletes living with them. Um, I, I love working with Ted. I, I, I guess I was known for entrepreneurship in a way, and, and um, I'll never forget a year ago, it was just a year ago exactly, I was very honored to be invited to UOP where Ted now is athletic director after being an assistant to the president. And he asked me to come down and talk to the coaches on entrepreneurship. Well, things change a little bit, right? And right now at Stanford, it's not so much an entrepreneurship. It's more that, hey, let's get together as an organization administratively and raise the funds we need mm -hmm. so the coaches don't have to do this kind of thing. But for me at the time, that couldn't be done, and I was very fortunate to have lived in that era. What can you recall about working with Bob Bowlesby, who was, I guess, Ted's successor? Well, I was fortunate to be in the search committee for both uh, Ted Leland and Bob Bowlesby. And, uh, uh, Bob, I, I thought, was a very strong administrator. Uh, again, he was very different. I, I found Bob, uh, I like Bob a lot. In fact, uh, uh, I, I think I really, really personally helped attract him here. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. I would pick him up from the hotel, take him to the interview place, uh, take him back. I think we, I really worked hard to get him here. Um, he was, I think, a very strong administrator, but wasn't as warm and fuzzy maybe as Ted. But I think he did a lot of great things. He changed a little bit how things were done here and how he did business. That's when the entrepreneurship model started to change a little bit. Uh, but I think what he did and, uh, was, was good. Uh, 
he wasn't here as long as the other ADs, most of them. And, um, but he had a great opportunity to become a conference. Can you tell us about yeah. some of the changes that, that, that Bob Bowlesby <coughs> implemented? In, in I think more consolidation inside the department. Uh, you know, our department had grown so much. Mm -hmm. We had some weaker areas, some strong areas. Um, I think he had some great appointments uh, that he, he made. Uh, uh, we have several departments, I think, that are incredible because of people he hired and put in place. Um, I, I think uh, he, the interim director there was Bill Walsh just before he came, and Bill was a great hire because we're trying to build a football stadium. Again, Bill was not totally healthy at the time, but he agreed to do this on an interim basis. Uh, Bob, I think, uh, made some great hires, obviously, with, with football uh, being the primary one. And I think Jim Harbaugh, by the way, I love working with Jim. Uh, it's interesting because in my time here, I've worked with Jim Moore, the coach of UCLA. I worked with his father here at Stanford, right. became pretty close to Jim Sr. I worked with Willie Shaw, David Shaw's father. I worked with Jack Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh's father. So it's interesting to see now three of their sons as, as head coaches here, at, or as renowned head coaches, two of them at Stanford. What about uh, Bernard Muir, current, the current AD? How, Bernard, how do you enjoy uh, working with him? Yeah, Bernard brings, you know, everyone's, everyone's yeah. different. And I think everyone for Stanford at the time has been the right person. Uh, I was not on the search committee for Bernard. It was more, an, uh, it was more a, a hired search committee in conjunction with the one internally. Uh, so I didn't know too much about him uh, when he came, but his background in paper is really good. I think he's much more warm and fuzzy maybe than Bob. His leadership style, again, is different. Uh, I think he's done some really outstanding things within the department as well as, as in terms of he's changed the structure of our coaches' meetings. He has a senior council that really, I think, is together on things. Uh, again, the entrepreneurship model is pretty much out the window, which is what I grew up on. So mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been a change for me, not a bad change, but it's been a change and things do change and usually for the better. And I think what Bob and, and Bernard have done uh, will stand Stanford in good stead in many years to come. You told us about, a little bit about Bob Murphy, uh, the, uh, the former sports information director at Stanford. Um, to what extent while you were a coach, were you working with the sports information directors, and, and what was the relationship you had with them? Well, again, it, well, first of all, Bob Murphy. Uh, Bob Murphy represents Stanford. He is Stanford. Uh, he hired me for my first job. At, uh, I became a high school teacher and coach, but at the same time, to make ends meet, I also had to get a job as a country club pro. And Bob, uh, at the time, was the manager of Fremont Hills Country Club in Los Alamos Hills. And he had just built, as their first big endeavor, a 50-meter pool there and attracted the National AAU Swimming Championship long course meet to Fremont Hills, this little place in the valley, isolated mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere, a few homes built around it. But uh, he hired me for my job there. And uh, we knew each other from Stanford a little bit. But he was a great SID. Uh, but again, SID was really football and basketball then. I, uh, our first press guide, I wrote it. I sold ads so I could get money to print it. Uh, I was the SID. Uh, it's just how things worked in those days. Uh, for the tennis program, for sports in general? For the tennis program. So uh, they, they did a mimeograph sheet uh, right. that they put together and it combined tennis and golf and that was fine. But I wanted to do something a little fancier so I would bind it. and. Uh, uh, I wrote the first one and picked out the pictures and did all the proofing and took it down to the printers and sold the ads to pay for it all because I couldn't, I, we didn't have it. Eventually the second year it was taken over by the SID office. But Bob uh, was quick on his feet. He had a tremendous knowledge of Stanford history. Uh, he was a perfect MC for things like our Hall of Fame banquet or whatever it might be. Ironically, when he retired, I kind of did some of those things for Bob in the interim. I, I, I emceed a couple of the Hall of Fame dinners and uh, did the Southern Cal Swing as MC when they went down with athletic, the football and basketball coaches down to Southern Cal Swing and, and kind of stood in his stead when he had 
had retired. But Bob went on, uh, was well recognized, and, and went on to become the athletic director of San Jose State. And, and in the sports world, there's no bigger name in the Bay Area than Bob Murphy. I was blessed to work with Bob and call him a friend. We've talked about your relationships with your, your, your ADs, your other coaches. When you, while you're at Stanford, while you've been at Stanford, have you formed relationships with any of the, the presidents of the universities? And what can you tell us about that? I, in, in particular, uh, I, I think I was probably closest to Don, Donald Kennedy. I'll never forget one time the late Bud, Bud Collins, who was a very big <laughs> name in tennis and right for the Boston Globe. Um, Bud was out visiting Stanford and his wife and I, I was giving them a tour across campus and Don walked by and he said, hey Dick, how are you? And, and I introduced Bud Collins to the president of the university. And Bud looked at me and he says, you know the president of the university? <laughs> I mean, it was just kind of, he just kind of shocked. And, yeah. and, uh, but that's how Don was. Uh, very, very, I thought, I thought the world of Donald Kennedy in his presidency. Um, I, I don't think we could have had a better president <coughs> in a successor than John Hennessy. And I've, and I just really valued the way that John Echemendi as provost and, and t has worked together with, uh, with John Hennessy. I think they've been an incredible force for Stanford, the tremendous things that they've accomplished in terms of, in terms of the development of the Arts Center, the engineering quad, uh, all the things that they've done, uh, the fundraising, I thought for sure John was going to retire when they exceeded this audacious goal of fundraising about five or six years ago by X amount, 25% or something. I thought, well, that's, that's the time he's going to retire. And fortunately for Stanford, he and John stayed on for another five or so years beyond that time. Uh, between Don Kennedy and John Hennessy, we could not have had better, better leaders, and those were the two that I, that I, I knew the most and, and the best. Um, I think um, Stanford has to realize how blessed they are. These, these people have really made Stanford what, they, what, what Stanford is today. I think uh, another person I, I would like <coughs> to mention, and Sam, I mentioned Provost, another good friend who I've had the opportunity to get to know well is Condi Rice. And in fact, uh, mm -hmm. before she started playing golf so much, she, she loved to play tennis. And the first ball that was struck in our indoor court here in the Toby Tennis Center was struck by Tad Toby in a rally with Condi Rice. She was invited special over to, to uh, take part in this. And she's been a tremendous uh, friend uh, ever since. We opened a bottle of champagne and christened the court. How was she as a tennis player? She's, well, she's a good athlete, number one, and, and a good tennis player, and just a sportsman in general. She's been so helpful to athletics in terms of recruiting, as an example, especially in football, uh -huh. uh, extolling the virtues of Stanford. She's very down to earth. Um, I've, I've, I've loved reading her life story. I love reading her book as Secretary of, of, of State. I, uh, the Secretary of State. I just, I just think the world of her and what she's done. Mm -hmm in the world of politics as well as what she's done for Stanford. Can you imagine a woman on the Bull Selection Committee? And I'm sure she knows as much or more than any of the other people on the right. committee. We've talked about numerous people, uh, and this has been fantastic. Are there any that are persons that we haven't talked about that you feel have had significant impacts on the growth and success of Stanford Athletics? You know, the sad part is there's so many people right. who've, who've done that that you're going <coughs> to forget, forget somebody. Uh, Don Kennedy, uh, John Hennessy, uh, Gerhard Casper. Uh, I did not know Gerhard very well, but uh, maybe you might think when he was hired he wouldn't be necessarily such a friend for athletics, but I think he really respected how the place of Stanford athletics and, and in the university, the role it played. Uh, I think uh, Condi and John Echemendi have done the same. We have a tremendous responsibility as coaches at Stanford to not violate the trust in us that the administration has placed and faculty have placed in us. And I think most faculty members understand the tremendous stress these athletes are going through, as many of the students are in very special areas, in addition to the normal studies. And, and we can't violate that. We have to do things right and with class to keep the faith not only of our administration but of our public as well. 
I worry a little bit about the place of college athletics in general right now. Where are we headed with all this money invested by TV? TV is controlling not only game times, but conference alignments, uh, everything else. At some point, I think that there's a real danger that, and one president can't do this. The university president cannot by himself stand up and say, this has gone too far. We're paying salaries that are outrageous in some cases, in some sports. Uh, we are spending too much. We're using student fees to do this and that. Uh, it's a, it's a, a war out there trying to build facilities. Uh, who can be better than whomever else? Who can build the best? Uh, at some point, someone's going to say, we as a nonprofit, our job is to educate the students. And the w a way athletics is going right now, it's a business. And it has to stop and we're gonna change what our school does. Well, the university president right now, I tried to do that, would be laughed out of the room by his constituents. But on the other hand, if a consortium of them, of them got together and said, look what's happening, this is not education, this is not our, this is not our mission statement, uh, then you might see a change. I, I think it's, something's going to happen. It may be that we have a big depression and the advertisers can't come back and pay what the oldest stations, the uh, uh, TV, the different media in terms of what they promised them. And then the money won't get to the conferences to be able to spend uh, what they're spending. And that's one danger. Uh, the money runs dry and they've committed to it for 10 year contracts. The money runs dry. The schools have already spent it. What's going to happen to athletics? The other thing is that more likely at some point a group of administrators, the, all the presidents of a certain conference are, are going to stand up and say, guys, this is wrong. We have to find another model to use. Uh, I think it's coming. I think it will happen. I don't know when it will happen. Have you had these kinds of discussions about the state of college athletics with other members of, of Stanford coaching? And do they share your views or do they have offered different views? I, no, I haven't really. This is just my own personal feeling. Okay. I, 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 uh, I, I spoke to our coaching staff after my first 50 years here last fall to start the year when I was earning my 50th year. And, and part of my message was, guys, we have to continue to do it right as every AD uh, has preached to us constantly. We have to continue to do it right. We have to continue to do it, do it in a first class manner. But there are changes out there. The Power Five Conference now is a threat to is a threat, I think, to college athletics as we see it and so on. But as far as informal discussions, no. And uh, I think everyone's just going to keep on taking as long as we can. And, uh, but there's going to come a time where things will change. Okay. I'd like to go back and talk a little bit more about uh, the merger of the women's program and the men's program and, and Title IX. I'd like to start off by asking you, tell us what was the, the state of women's athletic programs at Stanford in 1966 when you joined? Women's athletics? Yes, women, <laughs> women's athletics. <laughs> there was not such. Literally, uh, women's athletics was not even at the current club team model level. Uh, women's athletics, uh, there was a tennis team. Uh, my wife was on the team as an example. Uh, the tennis team did not play any matches away from home. If they did go to Cal, they would pay their own way. When they went to Ohio, they would go for funds for this great tournament in Southern California where the other schools participated. Uh, they would drive their own car. They would pay for their own hotel. Uh, when they had practice, they practiced twice a week on another set of courts on the other side of campus. They had old balls each day, never had new balls to practice with. Uh, absolutely no funding, really, for any kind of a woman's sport. It was uh, uh, an entirely different world. And uh, there were some great athletes who came to Stanford in tennis. Uh, Julie Anthony was top 10 in the country, did very well internationally. Julie Heldman, whose dad, whose mom had gone to Stanford, dad had gone to Stanford. Uh, very top 10 player, Frankie Albert, the great football player, his daughter Janie Albert, they were all here about the same time. Mm -hmm. They were great players. There were some great golfers, Mickey Wright and so on in Stanford at the time. But there weren't 
and, but they were mostly individual sports, uh, a couple of swimmers as an example, but it was completely separate. Uh, my coach at Stanford would once in a while invite one of the gals over to the men's practice to hit a little bit, but no one ever wanted to hit with a gal. Uh, it was not done regularly. and. Uh, uh, the coaches were mostly PE teachers who maybe had an interest in a certain sport, but uh, it, 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 it was, it's inconceivable what it was like. That's why I think my wife really appreciated being a coach with Title IX with the support that she got compared to what it was like a few years earlier when she was a student. Okay. Now in March of 1975, President Lyman announces that all men's and women's sports programs at Stanford are going to be merged in a combined department, which I think was called Department of Athletics, Physical Education and Recreation, or DAPER, uh, under Title IX. Tell us how you first became aware that this was being considered and your involvement in any discussions or dialogue on, the, on that. I, I was never involved in any discussions about it. I know Pam, Pam Strathairn of our women's program was very outspoken in a positive way on this. Joe Ritz was outspoken on it, uh, but the direction, frankly, came from the top. Uh, mm -hmm. President Lyman, I think, was the lead on this, and uh, it pertained to all of education, but it, it, athletics was a great example of where it, the concept had been violated or not upheld and or not embraced. Uh, it, it was scary, I think, to all the coaches uh, of seven sport program. By that time, we might have had one or two more than when I was a student, but it was a very small program, small department. How is everyone going to fit? As an example, uh, I had a varsity team, a freshman team, and a junior varsity team. I had no assistant coach. Uh, we had 11 tennis courts for those three teams who all practiced at the same time. Now, women are gonna come over to, quote, my tennis courts. I'm not gonna be able to have a JV team or for, uh, freshman team I had to have. I couldn't have a JV team anymore. I had to cut my squad size down so there'd be room for the women to play in the same courts, and an equal number of courts. So it had that kind of effect on all of us, and I think the biggest thing was that it cut out the opportunity for a lot of men. But, but having four daughters, three of whom played college sport, it was a gigantic thing for their future okay. and the right thing to do. When you learn about that this merger is going to take place, you, you talked about certain concerns that you had. But by and large, um, were you in favor of it, against it? What benefits or detriments did you see with it? Well, again, I had four daughters, and tennis uh, was a sport they all played, and, and some migrated to, to swimming or volleyball as time went on, but they were all, they all played sport. Uh, even at that, at that age, it was coming about. Uh, they were starting in their sports in their tennis, as an example. So I could see it from that standpoint, but I think everyone was really threatened and very protective of their own turf, so to speak. It was not an easy thing, not only to sell to the alums, but even to sell to the coaches. And it was, it was not asked upon us. It, it, our opinions weren't asked. This mm -hmm. is how it was going to be. It was very firm. And so that everyone just said, hey, this is how it's going to be. Uh, we better get on board. And we did. And part of that was the leadership that we, that we had at the time, starting with President Lyman. Um, I think it was... Uh, in retrospect, it, I, I think a lot of us fought it. I can't say I fought it, but having only daughters at the time, I, I thought that would be a tremendous opportunity. But again, I was looking out for me. How is it going to affect me? And in fact, not only was our squad size reduced, but my scholarships were reduced from eight to five to, now, to then four and a half. Women still have eight full scholarships. So there are some injustices that way. And uh, my feeling always was that football, the nature of the beast, should be kept out of the equation. And you have the same number of scholarships for every sport, therefore. But because of Foothill, you, because of football, men's golf has less scholarships than women's golf. Men's basketball has one or two less scholarships than women's basketball right on down the line to make it even out. So that's something I still have a hard time accepting. I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it... I think, we, I think it should be addressed on a sport-by-sport sport basis, and it was not, and I still believe it should have been, and I still believe it should be. Yeah. So the, the decision is made to, to, to merge the, the, the programs, the men's and women's programs. Can you tell us how that merger was implemented in the first couple of years, what it was like? 
things of that nature. Well, immediately, uh, the woman, my wife was hired as coach. The woman started practicing that next year, that same year, the next year with us. Uh, the schedule was expanded for women. There was money put into their travel schedule. Our budgets were essentially equal. Uh, that there was a big expense, a tremendous expense. Uh, the AD, athletic director, did a great job, department, a great job of making this work because you don't just do it. You have uniforms, the same number of uniforms. Uh, we weren't sponsored by an organization then. We were schlepping around for our uniforms. I know one year, uh, we had Snoopy uniforms, uh, a little Snoopy dog with red and white sweats, but the men had what the woman had. Uh, our trips, we did more, many of our trips together. Our first big team trip was a trip we took every Thanksgiving uh, to somewhere with a group of boosters. And the coaches would put on a clinic for the boosters. They'd, people going would pay for the clinic, and that would pay for the team's way to go on this trip. So I think the third year that we did this, uh, First trip in 1972, didn't do it in 73, did it 75, 76. In 1976, the woman's Title IX right away went with us. When we did a family day where we had people come in and hit with our kids, it was a men's and women's family day. So I think we really did a great job of, ad of adapting immediately to tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if there's anything, there the men's tennis program and in any, many sports is not discriminated against because the women's in the same sport have better advantages, like scholarships. What was your players' reaction to the fact when it was when they it was announced to them that there was going to be this merger of the two? You know, groups? I don't think the players. They they by that time, I mean, coed dorms uh, had they when did coed dorms start? I think coed dorms might have started by then. You know, it was. Uh, that that was not, I don't think I don't remember anything being a big thing. My players, I think yeah. the coach is just worried about what's going to happen to them. But our budget was not reduced. Our our uh, uh, our scholarships were. Our budget was not reduced, so so it didn't affect us in any way other than cutting out our JV teams. Yeah. And now we have great club programs that take that vacuum up.